homicide detectives in DeKalb County, Georgia, need your help. No one saw or heard anything. Two grieving families need closure. Why? 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 Can a fresh look at two eerily similar cold cases breathe new life into the investigations? And is the key to solving at least one of those murders hidden in this recording of the victim's last moments alive? Sitting down for TV interviews isn't the kind of thing police in Georgia's fourth most crowded county normally have time to do. We worked about 3 a.m. Um, this morning. Then we had another homicide at 8 a.m. Uh, this morning. It can be very hectic at some time. But Lieutenant Rod Bryant from the DeKalb County Homicide Unit is taking time out today to talk about two cases he says need to be solved. The first started years ago with a 911 call from a hysterical young woman. It was a pretty terrible call. The girl making the call hadn't heard from her sister in two days and finally decided to go to her house and let herself in. Uh, she went in location. She uh, called for her sister, did not receive an answer. Uh, she went upstairs and checked and saw her sister in the bedroom uh, lying on the floor in a puddle of blood. And she called 911 afterwards. When detectives arrive, they find the sister in shock and 27-year-old Tamika Taylor lying dead on her bedroom floor, stabbed 57 times. She was nude. And there was blood smeared all over the carpet. There was blood on the walls. And there was blood leading to the bathroom. It was a pretty bad scene. Tamika's sister tells detectives about the last time they spoke, and the investigation begins. Our last conversation was two days before she was found by her sister. So we got to go back two days of this young lady's life and try to find out what happened to her. Even further back than that, if you ask Tamika's father, Matthew, and his wife, Gwendolyn. Tamika was always an ambitious little girl. Getting a, a B in school was like getting a D in school to her, because she always wanted to make all A's. It was a drive to succeed that followed Tamika into adulthood, where at just 27 years old, she was working as a highly respected loan officer for a major financial firm, living in a house she bought for herself. I learned that she, she made more money than me. <laughs> that made me upset. <laughs> but uh, no, nah, she, uh, she did very well for herself, very well. Tamika's friend and co-worker, Rochelle Howard, says there was no secret to Tamika's success. Oh, my God, she just, a lot of energy. She would come in and she said, hi, I'm Tamika Taylor. And she would stick her hand out and just go at it. She was not afraid of anybody, just whatever she needed to do to get the job done. And getting the job done in a competitive market in and around Atlanta often included going to networking parties and handing out business cards. At least that was the plan that Thursday night in December when Rochelle last talked to her friend. We um, talked around five. She was getting ready to go to the party. She's wearing this red dress. She was all excited about uh, attending the party and she was going to call me later on. And I never heard from her again. She just was gone. Police believe sometime shortly after Tamika hung up the phone with Rochelle, she either opened her door to someone she knew or was surprised by an intruder already inside. There was no forced entry, no evidence of any forced entry. It looked like the victim possibly just arrived home. Nothing out of the ordinary was observed downstairs. However, the killer made his way in. The evidence shows Tamika was forced into her upstairs bedroom where she was stripped of her clothes, sexually assaulted, and then stabbed almost one time for every second in a minute. It's, it's very savage, very violent uh, type of death. Tamika's father will never forget receiving the news. I was sitting in, at home and got a call from my other daughter, the one that found her, and told me what happened. And I just dropped everything. She was too young to be taken away. No parent should outlive their children. Nor should any parent have to see their child like Matthew did that day. And I just saw them come out with her in the bag, and I, that just really hurt me to my heart. For the family, it's a scene that makes no sense for a lot of reasons. 
The fact that someone did hurt her was such a shock to us because she was such a loving, kind person. So it never dawned on us that anyone would ever want to hurt her. But almost immediately, because this is our body being rolled over. Detectives seemed well on their way to identifying a suspect. There were fingerprints found at the location. We also found uh, bloody footprints. And on top of all that, a male's DNA recovered from the victim's body. While investigators wait for the results to come back on that DNA, they work on building a profile of the killer based on the nature of the crime and some knife wounds that pierced Tamika's body. Uh, the person was very angry. Uh, I think it was personal. I think uh, that person possibly rejected uh, by Miss Taylor. Tamika, she was about 5'10 to 5'11. So this person was very physically uh, uh, strong. We strongly feel that it was somebody that she knew, that she let in, that she was comfortable enough to at least open the door. Like maybe an ex-boyfriend, detectives quickly identify anyone Tamika may have been dating. And that included at least two men who lived not far from her house, one of whom made it clear he was angry Tamika didn't want to be more than just friends. But police questioned both men along with several others, took DNA from everyone. The results? Their DNA did not match the evidence that we had. In fact, when the DNA from the crime scene was analyzed and returned from the lab, it was a strand that led nowhere. That DNA has not been compared to anyone at this time. Detectives are at a loss. Tamika's own family completely stumped. Then just weeks after the murder of Tamika Taylor, only six miles away, it happens again. Another young woman is stabbed multiple times in her home. And this time, detectives have one chilling piece of evidence. The killer's own voice recorded by the victim's cell phone. Just six weeks after DeKalb County, Georgia resident Tamika Taylor was stabbed to death in her own bedroom, and only six miles from that crime scene, 34-year-old Jennifer Clemmings makes a desperate call to a friend. It goes straight to voicemail. Fourth message, today, 8, 14 p.m. The first thing you hear is Jennifer's phone dropping to the floor. After that, the sound of Jennifer trying to calm down an angry man. That voicemail recorded a voice exchange between Jennifer and the suspect. It lasted for about 30 seconds. During a recording, she stated, I'm going to give you your money. I'm going to pay you back your money. Then you can hear the increasing desperation in Jennifer's voice as she tries to calm things down. That suspect was basically telling her to be still, quit playing, what he's about to do to her. He's about to sexually assault her. And then these chilling words. Her voice was very afraid, very shaky. And you even heard her saying a small prayer. The voicemail cuts off shortly after that prayer. When Jennifer's friend finally hears the message, she immediately calls the cops, but it's already too late. The officers went immediately to that location. The doors unlocked. They went inside. They found Jennifer in the bedroom. Jennifer was deceased at that time. Right away, homicide detectives can't help but notice the similarities between Jennifer's crime scene and that of Tamika Taylor's from just weeks before. Her body was nude. She was lying on the floor on her stomach in a puddle of blood. She was stabbed over 20 to 30 times. An apparent act of rage, just like with Tamika Taylor. In addition, there was evidence both victims had been sexually assaulted. It was too much of a coincidence. 
And there were other similarities between the victims that were hard to ignore. Like Tamika, Jennifer Clemmings was an ambitious young self-made woman who lived on her own. Jennifer was like, oh my gosh, she just was the joy of the family. You know, she tried to make sure we were all okay. Miriam Gordon, one of Jennifer's four older sisters, remembers Jennifer as a hardworking girl who at 34 years old already had an extremely successful career. Jennifer was one of Mary Kay's top sellers. She either even got a pink uh, Cadillac. And according to friends and family, Jennifer was giving back to the community, opening up jobs to those in need. She pay people to do work around our house. She get people from the church, she get people from Home Depot or somewhere from the neighborhood. So then who would want her dead? Miriam says she was puzzled from the moment one of the other sisters called her with the news. She said she was murdered and I'm like, no, that doesn't happen in our family. We don't hang out with anyone that would hurt us. And when police started digging, they found the same. Jennifer had no obvious enemies. There were no usual suspects. At that time, she wasn't romantically involved with anyone that we knew of. Police collect the suspect's DNA from the scene, as well as the knives he used to take Jennifer's life. But just as in Tamika Taylor's case, nothing matched anyone in the system. I would not even imagine that Jennifer had anyone in her circle that could have potentially bring her harm. So police search for clues in that voicemail. The voice was very distinctive. Uh, it was a southern male. And then there was one part of the voicemail where Jennifer can be heard almost whispering in the background. Could she be saying a name? We listened to it. We sent it off to be analyzed. We have the FBI analyzed it. Several years after that, we sent it to some super smart students at Georgia Tech to analyze it. Uh, but she did not say a name. We could not get a name out of that recording. And neither can anyone else. We let the parents listen to it. We let her friends listen to it. We even played it on the news where the public can listen to it. No one recognized the voice. But while the recording didn't give detectives a name, it did seem to reveal a motive. The person was upset, they didn't get their money. So that indicates to us that this person possibly done some type of work for us, and she owed them money. Maybe one of those same people Jennifer hired from the community. She was having um, work done on her house. And police did search for those day laborers. Most of them we did track down, but she could have used some ones that we never knew about. Detectives still feel it's a solid lead, but have yet to find anyone who matches the evidence. And what about the other big question? Is there a connection to the Tamika Taylor case? Both women live less than 10 minutes from each other and were murdered in similar ways by men police believe the victims knew. But surprisingly, based on evidence investigators aren't releasing, they say that the only connection is coincidence and that they're looking for two different killers. I do not believe the person responsible for killing Tamika Taylor is responsible for killing Jennifer Clemens. For Jennifer, the leading theory continues to be that someone she hired may have killed her over a missed payment. But for Tamika Taylor, investigators still need the public's help to even establish a motive. It could have been a sexual assault, someone that surprised her. It could have been a friend of hers who she possibly rejected and that person snapped. But no clear motive has been established at this time. And yet detectives say they do believe both of these cases can be solved. They're just waiting for the right tip to come in. We have evidence, we just have to match it to a offender. I don't wanna give away too much in case we find the subject. To find the right person that done this, we need to leave the stuff out only we know and he knows. For now, the families of Tamika Taylor and Jennifer Clemmings will continue to hold out hope and cling to memories. Why, why, why? There's a void that, that just can't be filled. Regardless of why that person did this, it's not going to change the hurt. But we need to know why. Why did you hurt her? What I missed about my little sister 
is that magnetic smile. I miss, I'm sorry. <laughs> I miss that she wasn't there to say goodbye to my mom. And just before this all happened, my mom was suffering from MS. And after Jennifer passed away, my mom never left the bed. She gave up. The family would love justice for Jennifer to be able to hold someone accountable for the viciousness of this crime. If you know anything about the murders of Tamika Taylor or Jennifer Clemmings, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers Atlanta at 1-404-577-TIPS.